Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Welcome back. So we're going to talk about the Druids. Such a curious subject. It is. And if we say Druid, what comes to your mind? You know, I think of a person who's cloaked in darkness, but I don't think they're all like that. Mm, interesting. Well, we we watched uh, this first season of this show, Britannia. I'm a sucker for like historical pieces. And um, yeah, I've been a history junkie since I was like a, a little, little kid. But what is the truth? And, you know, we talk about his his story, history, his story. You know, from what perspective do we get the truth? Because, again, history, his story is written by the victors. It is. And these folks, they didn't write anything down. No, they didn't. They didn't. As we look at the show's representation of the head druid, Interesting, in the show, he's also referred to as the second man, Mm -hmm. as in, you know, like the second man of creation, and they even allude to it in the show that he's like 10,000 years old. He's he's been around a while. Interesting, really interesting, you know. We've talked about myths and legends from around the world. We talk about, you know, the biblical Methuselah living 969 years. We've seen the Sumerian kings list with people living, uh, well, reigning for tens of thousands of years, let alone living. And then we have the Taoist immortal legends about those who understand how to practice Qigong to such a level that they become immortal. And then we have talked about uh, the feats of the Buddhist monks. And if you ever watch any of the things the Buddhist monks can do, it's amazing. And then there's been people that swear they've witnessed them levitate and do all sorts of magical things. And the same thing also we see with the yogis from the yogic path. It's fascinating to see all these myths and legends. It's fascinating to look at different belief systems. Well, these were people that were very, very tied to nature. Everything with them was all about nature. Well, yes, nature was the ex- the expression of source. And, you know, very understandable. And it's interesting how, how many of us, you know, spend most of our day inside instead of being out in nature. Right, in a cubicle or something. Yeah, you know, staring at a screen mm-hmm. or staring at our phones. Mm-hmm. Instead of staring at the sky, seeing uh, omens in the way the clouds are rolling in, seeing omens and signs in the way the birds are flying, or what are the animals doing? Did you notice that squirrel is stuffing a ton of nuts in his mouth and he looks really big and fluffy and he's hurrying like, you know, something's going to happen? Well, maybe you're going to have a bad winter. Right, exactly. You know, they learned a lot from the creatures and the plants and, and the ground. They just knew all these things were going to happen based on their surroundings. Now, the picture of the Druids that is portrayed in this series, Britannia, uh, which was, is you could watch it on Amazon Prime, is very, very dark, (laughs) to say the least. I mean, we are talking about uh, things like human sacrifice as well. And, you know, all sorts of bloody and scary things. Yeah, it's fair warning. It's difficult to watch. Absolutely brutal to watch in some spots, um, but fascinating. And again, his his story is written by the victors. So what is true and what is really accurate? Um, and by the way, there's a lot of modern Druids that are speaking up and saying that they hate the way that they're being portrayed in this series and they take big offense to it, as we will um, talk about. There, there are... Modern day Druidry uh, pro- members and proponents that are here on the world right now on the planet trying to recreate uh, what was taken and lost over the course of time. Now, they had abilities, these these people, you know, very much shamanic. Oh, you know? oh my gosh, the shaman, shamanism or shamanship, the things these people could do and between the worlds was is incredible. And it's interesting, too, because like so many different traditions it, uh, are really the same in, in some ways. You know, the it's like it's like cooking. Yeah. 
again. Not to equate with cooking again. So, I mean, we could put up on the cutting board, you know, broccoli and garlic and maybe some onions and some tomatoes or what have you. And we could turn that into a, a Mexican meal. We could turn it into most definitely a Chinese meal. We could turn it into an Italian meal. It's the same ingredients. It has different different flavors to it. And we see the same thing here when we look at these different belief systems. At the core, there's so much that is the same. For instance, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of what they believed in, well, they, they were nature, nature, nature worshipers. They did believe in reincarnation. So they, just like uh, the, the Buddhists, basically, the Hindus, the Jains, uh, and so many others, they believe that our soul is eternal. You know, there is that side of us that has has always existed. There was never a time when it didn't exist. And it will exist always. You can't destroy it. And that's exactly what um, Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And it, they had the same belief system there. They also believed in karma, the law of ca cause and effect. So they were right along with that. Uh, they had very mystical, quote-unquote, practices that they did. They could put their consciousness into another animal, another being, and see through their eyes. And again, we have that also in the Native American traditions. My dad uh, was very fond of saying, you know, he was in a bird flying again, you know, that was part of that Native American tradition as well. And, you know, again, we could look at... Um, those in indigenous beliefs of those people of the Americas, but not just the Americas in Siberia. There's people all over the globe have had this belief system. It's a very, very ancient belief system, uh, way older than what we have what we have dominating the world today. Yeah, I think it's very curious. It's very interesting. I also think it's very misunderstood. Yeah, completely misunderstood. Because again, through through focus through meditative practice they could shift their consciousness again into a crow and go fly and see what's happening you know is there an invading army are the, are the romans coming well they could see the romans coming and uh, w these are the type of abilities that all humans have and and can be developed and when we're living in a state of oneness with nature and when we're not loaded up with things that you get down at the drugstore for instance, uh, or drinking fluoridated water or being exposed to all sorts of frequencies or eating junk food, you know, GMO and white sugar, you know, then these abilities can soar. Right. It, it does take some work, though. You need to really clean yourself out. So, you know, what is the true story of these people? And, you know, how about the Druids today as well? Uh, well, definitely they were an interesting group to say the least. Now, first off, we should say, basically, the Celts are the people from which the Druids come. And the Celtic people, as we see here, there was different groups of Celts, and they were basically over Europe. And the Celts were a collection of Indo-European people in parts of Europe and Anatolia identified by their use of the Celtic language, their specific language and other cultural similarities, the history of pre-Celtic Europe and the exact relationship between ethnic, linguistic, and cultural factors in the Celtic world remains uncertain and controversial. The exact geographic spread of the ancient Celts is disputed as well. The ways in which the Iron Age inhabitants of Great Britain and Ireland should be regarded as Celts has become the subject of controversy. According to one theory, the common root of all the Celtic languages, the Proto-Celtic language, arose in the late Bronze Age, Urnfield culture of Central Europe, which flourished from around 1200 BC. According to another theory proposed in the 19th century, the first people to adopt cultural characteristics regarded as Celtic were the people of the Iron Age Hallstatt culture in Central Europe between 800 and 450 BC, named for the rich grave finds in Hallstatt, Austria. It is thus that the area is sometimes called the Celtic homeland. 
and by or during the later Latene period, about 450 BC to the Roman conquest. Uh, they, they named the uh, site, the Latene site, which was in Switzerland. Uh, the Celtic culture was supposed to have expanded by transcultural diffusion or migration to the British Isles, France, and the Low Countries, uh, Bohemia, Poland, and much of Central Europe, as well as the Iberian Peninsula and Northern Italy as well. And then following this Celtic settlement of Southeast Europe beginning in 279 BC, as far east as central Anatolia and modern-day Turkey. The Galatians over there, the Galatians of, of the biblical reference. Yep. <laughs> so, interesting. So, the Druids were a class of learned people. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you could kind of say aristocracy. Um, perhaps that's not the right word. You know, they were both the religious leaders and, you know, they were also the people that were guiding the culture strongly. And what I noticed is that they're very different from one another. They're very unique. So they they really had a wide variety of roles. They were philosophers, teachers, judges, and they were the holders of the repository of communal wisdoms about the natural world and the traditions of the people. And they were also the mediators between the humans and the gods. And as thus, you know, because of that, they wielded great power and influence. Oh, boy, did they. They sure did, you know. So, again, the priestly class, we've seen this. We's, we saw with the, which not everybody believes in, uh, the Aryan invasion of India, things changed because, you know, then over time, the Brahmin class rose in power and the priest rose to the top position in society and you know everything started to revolve around that which you know gave them a lot of riches wealth power and control it sure did and then of course we see the catholic church you know same thing rich richness wealth control Mm -hmm. power exactly so they were often revered and you know there there is an interesting um well Probably most of the info that we get really comes from Julius Caesar and the Roman uh, invasion. So again, you know, the victors write the stories. Um, But yeah, Julius Caesar did invade uh, after conquering Gaul. So he's one of the biggest sources that we have about, you know, exactly what they were like, you know, their practices their power their traditions again they didn't write anything down so that makes it difficult it really really does when you don't write anything down but they depended on each other you know storytelling from person to person it was important to them and um what's also interesting is like our little history of mistletoe and everything comes from them the uh tradition of of mistletoe so Ancient sources provided some tantalizing hints to the things that the Druids held in great importance. In one passage, Pliny the Elder, who lived about 2,000 years ago, talks about the importance of mistletoe and the fifth day of the moon. He said that mistletoe is gathered with rites replete with religious awe. This is done more particularly on the fifth day of the moon, the day which is the beginning of their months and years and also of their ages talks about the importance of animal sacrifice and fertility to the Druids. They bring thither two white bulls, the horns of which are bound then for the first time. Clad in a white robe, the priest ascends the tree and cuts the mistletoe with a golden sickle, which is received by others in a white cloak. They then immolate the victims while offering prayers, wrote Pliny the Elder. It's belief with them that the mistletoe taken in drink will impart fertility to all the animals that are barren and that this is an antidote for all poisons. So interesting, you know, there, there's rumors that they also performed a human sacrifice. Now, they say this may not be accurate, but, you know, this is basically w- what we get again from uh, Julius Caesar as well as other sources. Right. So, a man named Diodorus Siculus, who lived more than 2,000 years ago, said that while the Druids were always present during a human sacrifice, 
It was another group known as the Vates that carried out the sacrifice itself. And then that gets into, well, how widespread uh, was human sacrifice among the cultures that the Druids served? And, and that is a mystery. We do know it, it, it was done in Scandinavian traditions, in, in Germanic. It was done in many, many areas, you know, as well as the Middle East. So it, it was a, and then, you know, a horrible thing that was in so many people's belief system. And then, you know, when you get down to it, war itself is human oh, yeah. sacrifice, is it, it is. not? It, war is horrible. So it's very interesting because there are modern day Druids as well. And as we see here, this is a representation of what they would have been dressed, dressed like in their times. Uh, the most famous one of all probably was Merlin, you know, Merlin the Magician. And, uh, you know, obviously that would be one of the most fascinating figures and biggest legends that we have coming from this part of the world. And Merlin was a man of mystery and magic, contradiction and controversy that surrounded his life. He wore many hats. He was a wizard or a sorcerer, a prophet, a bard, an advisor or a tutor. He appeared as a young boy with no father. That's interesting. Appeared as an old wise man, freely giving his wisdom to the four successive British kings. He was a dotting old fool who couldn't control his lust over beautiful women, who hold him in fear and contempt. He had even appeared as a madman after bloody battle, and had fled into the forest and learned how to talk to the animals, where he became known as the Wild Man of the Woods. Gets me thinking about Kernunos and Hearn. Merlin was the last of the Druids, a Celtic shaman, the priest of nature and keeper of knowledge, particularly of the arcane secrets. So, you know, and again, getting back to the shamans, they're walkers between the worlds. So they could go to the afterworld, which you might view as, you know, the astral plane, and they could com commune and get answers from beings there and then come back and tell the king, for instance, what's what's going on. Pretty fascinating abilities. So share with them what you saw when I asked you, well, is there any Druids like the old Druids, like the old Druids that had, you know, incredible abilities and powers like we see portrayed in uh, this series? Is there any of them like that, that have that type of ability and power that they can you know, foresee the future, trans transfer their consciousness into animals, commune with the other side clearly and effectively, and even control the weather and things like that on a very, very high scale. Fortunately, unfortunately, what I picked up is that there's three. There's three on the planet. They have, they're very powerful. They, they can manipulate other beings. They can manipulate situations. And I picked up that there is one in Asia I picked up there's actually one in Washington DC and I I picked up that there was one in Africa and there the influence that over them that's over them now is a dark influence they're not nice okay so you know who is controlling these these druids well it's more of a draconian type of influence I can't see exactly I can just explain the the feeling that's influencing them is a draconian like feeling i'm curious the one that's in dc is he working for a government per se <laughs> on any sort of level uh perhaps yeah interesting very very curious to say the least and here you see there's there's actually druidry.org uh, and talks about their beliefs and what's interesting is that it if this history is true you know, modern day Druids are, are very far removed from the bloodiness that we right. see back there. Um, because, you know, they've basically got a theology that's very, very similar to so much of the Eastern traditions, uh, the indigenous people's traditions and, you know, shamanic traditions. And, you know, very, very, in, in the case of modern Druids, maybe not those three that you saw, um, but these people, which I'll give you all the links to, um, very much more in lines with Ahimsa, which is, you know, the belief system of doing no harm to others. Right. That's the best way to be. 
So, you know, Druidry is a spiritual path, a religion to some, a way of life to others. Druids share a belief in the fundamentally spiritual nature of life. Some will favor a particular way of understanding the source of this spiritual nature and may feel themselves to be animists, pantheists, polytheists, monotheists, or duotheists. Others will avoid choosing any one concept of deity, believing that by its very nature this is unknowable by the mind. And then this is what we call Brahman, the unknowable. This is, you know, basically... Um, it's this, it's the Tao again. It's it's the Tao because the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. Anything you could you could pin down, anything you you could say this is it. It's not mm -hmm. because it's beyond that. And uh, we've also done that reference to Shiva. You know that which is not. So monotheistic druids believe that there's one deity, either a goddess or a god or a being who is better named Spirit or the Great Spirit. You know as as so many. Uh, indigenous beliefs to the Americas, they just simply, the Great Spirit mm -hmm. and, and the Great Mother, Mother Earth. You know, it's just that same thought. It's all a matter of labels. To remove misleading associations to gender, they'll just call it the Great Spirit. But other Druids are duotheists, believing that the deity exists as a pair of forces or beings, which they often characterize as the God and the Goddess. And again, this is what's commonly used in paganism and in Wicca. And then again, all goddesses are one goddess is, is another pagan belief. And even though you see it shown in so many different ways, what we're talking about is archetypal forces. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. Polytheistic druids believe that many gods and goddesses exist, while animists and pantheists believe that deity does not exist as one or more personal gods, but is instead present in all things and is everything. And again, we've talked about that that so many times that, of course, if God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, it has to be in everything. Everything. That's just a given. Mm -hmm. And again, so like when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, that's how. Yeah. And we also said, again, you know, all these things you see me doing, you will do greater. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of comments like that. Yeah, exactly. There's so many things that appear to be well they appear to not make sense you know but they do when you look deeper now whether they have chosen to adopt a particular viewpoint or not the greatest characteristic of most modern day druids lies in their tolerance of diversity that's something that should be cultivated globally a druid gathering can bring people together who have widely varying views about deity or none as, and they will happily participate in ceremonies together, celebrate the seasons, enjoy each other's company, realizing that none of us has monopoly on truth and that diversity is both healthy and natural. Nature forms an important focus of the reference and that whatever beliefs they hold about deity, the Druids sense nature as divine or sacred. Every part of nature is sensed as part of the great web of life with no one creature or aspect of it having supremacy over any other. Unlike religions that are anthropocentric, believing that humanity occupies a central role in the scheme of life, this conception is systematic and holistic and sees humankind as just one part of a much wider family of life. Mm -hmm. And it is, and it's a very beautiful thing. So I wanted to give you guys a little taste of this and see if you found it interesting. Uh, we look forward to your comments as always. Thank you for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. We can't do it without you. Make sure you are subscribed and have the bell clicked as well. As always, guys, God bless and namaste. Namaste.